Welcome everyone. This is Sarah Zeith from School Help. Thank you for joining us today and participating in this Year of Children's Vision webinar. Before I turn it over to Kira Baldonado from Prevent Blindness, I would like to review a quick, few quick things about today's webinar. Our presenters will take about one hour for the presentation, after which we will have time for questions. We will not be taking audio questions, but we would like you to submit your questions via the questions interface in GoToWebinar. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar. Please include the name of the presenter the question is intended for. This webinar will be recorded, and a link to it will be emailed to you for future playback. We will also include a copy of the presentation slides and a certificate of attendance. You will receive this email in about three to four business days. And with that, I will hand it off to Kira. All right, thank you, Sarah. I'm just waiting for be able to advance. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so welcome, everyone, for uh, our current webinar in the Year of Children's Vision. Uh, I was pleased that you're able to all join us today. A little bit about the Year of Children's Vision before we get into today's presentation. The goal of Year of Children's Vision is to provide national guidance to staff of Head Start, Early Head Start, and other early childhood programs with the goal of standardizing approaches to vision screening, improving follow-up for eye care, providing family-friendly educational information, and giving you a consultation with some of the nation's leading pediatric eye care providers, hoping to ensure best practices. The Year of Children's Vision is made possible by a collaboration among leading national vision health organizations. And I encourage everybody to uh, go to the website you see listed there and uh, find out more about all the organizations involved in Year of Children's Vision, uh, find access to previous webinars that have been included in this series, as well as a wealth of resources that have been made possible through this effort. Go ahead and advance. There we go. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, key educational points for families around children's vision, including frequently encountered vision problems for children and the impact on daily activities as well as development and common treatment problem options. Understand common barriers to eye care and arming families with resources, access to providers, preparing for the eye exam, and needed treatment. And we'll talk a little bit about evaluating the effectiveness of your vision health program. As we get started today, I'd like to uh, provide uh, background for our presenters. Uh, we're honored to have uh, wonderful presenters today. Um, I'd like to start off with Dr. Sandy Bloch. Dr. Bloch is the medical director for the Illinois Eye Institute Clinic at the Princeton Elementary School. as a school-based vision clinic that serves Chicago public school children. Dr. Bloch has also, also authored numerous publications and conducted presentations to students and peers around the world. Additionally, she's been a consultant to the Special Olympics Lions Club International Opening Eyes Program since 1995 and has been instrumental in developing global vision screening programs. Her interests lie in primary eye care for children of all ages with a special focus on persons with disabilities and the process of diagnosis and treatment of visually related learning problems. I'm also pleased to welcome you to Dr. Stacey and Lyons. Dr. Lyons is Chief of Pediatric Optometric Services at the New England College of Optometry and director of the Framingham Public School Vision Center. It's the first public school-based comprehensive vision clinic in Massachusetts. Dr. Lyons is a member of Prevent Blindness's National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health Advisory Committee and was also on our national expert panel. Dr. Lyons has also served as the director of Special Olympics, opening eyes at the Massachusetts State Games in 2000, where she screens the vision of participating athletes. And also, I'd like to introduce you to our question moderator for the day, Dr. Kay Chaplin. Dr. Chaplin is a member of the advisory committee for the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health at Prevent Blindness. And she helps the ophthalmology department at West Virginia University Eye Institute to create the Vision Initiative for Children, a program that trained and equipped individuals to screen the vision of preschoolers. While working at WVU, she also consulted about preschool vision screening for the Good Light Company and has since been employed by the Good Light Company. Dr. Chaplin is also a member of the West Virginia School-Based Health Assembly, School Health, and Medical Service Team. And finally, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kira Baldonado, 
and I joined the staff of Prevent Blindness in 2011 as director of the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. In that role, I'm responsible for providing direction and leadership to early detection efforts and other essential public health interventions related to children's vision screening systems. I coordinate the strategic and programmatic efforts of the center, including a national expert panel's work, the advisory committee, federal relationships, and pilot program initiatives that we have in five states. Prior to joining the center, I worked at Prevent Blindness as Ohio affiliate for eight years as director of marketing and community services. Before I turn it off to our first presenter, Dr. Block, I'd just like to remind everybody that you will be receiving a link to the recording of the webinar after today's presentation. And you'll receive that link in an email that should be sent in the next three to four days, as well as a certificate of attendance that you can use uh, to apply for professional education with your association. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Block to start off today's webinar. Thank you, Kara. I'm just going to go to a first slide. Uh, OK, I have. No access. There we go. OK. My purpose today is to talk about some of the more common vision problems that you'd probably experience within uh, preschool programs. And the reason for me to do this, I know I've talked a great deal about screening programs in other webinars, but sometimes it's important to have a little better concept about the ideas of what types of vision problems there are and what kinds of impact it might have in the classroom which would include treatment as well as understanding what the problem is. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that vision problems really are the most common disability in the United States. There are over 6 million people around the world that are considered visually impaired because of some of the uncorrected refractive errors and other eye health disab disabling conditions. Vision is the most common or most prevalent handicapping condition in childhood. And we all know that, that early detection and treatment of vision problems usually can resolve or at least reduce or improve the outcomes of uh, vision corrections if you involve uh, corrections early on. So the things that I wanted to focus on, on on the next 20 minutes are amblyopia, or what's referred to as the lazy eye, strabismus, which is a when the two eyes are not focused at the same place, meaning that one of the eyes is turning, and uncorrected refractive errors, myopia or nearsightedness, hyperopia or farsightedness, and astigmatism. So let's start with the one that we talk about the most, amblyopia. Amblyopia is oftentimes very misunderstood. It is basically reduced visual acuity in an otherwise healthy eye. We don't consider refractive error as a health issue. It's an issue based on the size, shape, and power of the eye. It does result from um, not using an eye due to an eye turn, high refractive errors, or medial opacities, which could include something as simple as a cataract in a child. There have been a lot of studies recently done, and the prevalence for most of these ranges from just under 2% to about 5% in a normal general population. It's very different when you talk about a special needs population. So amblyopia is really one of the primary reasons that vision screenings take place. We are looking to find out whether a child is actually at risk for the development of amblyopia. But it's actually the doctor in the eye exam that makes the official diagnosis and truly identifies what the problem is that may eventually lead to amblyopia or lazy eye and what the appropriate treatment options should be for amblyopia. The treatment options vary drastically depending on what the underlying condition is that leads to lazy eye or amblyopia. There's been a great deal of work that's been done over the past 10 years. Uh, there's actually an uh, organization that uh, started working in Florida using both optometry and ophthalmology together, investigating treatment options and diagnoses of amblyopia to see what is the most successful. And it has changed the way most eye care providers actually practice and treat amblyopia. So if the decreased vision is the result of an anatomical or pathological cause, the treatment might be surgery or another uh, medical treatment. 
as you see in this picture, you see a child with their eyelid covering part of the eye. The issue that we look at is, is the lid covering the pupil or the part where information gets to the back of the eye, where uh, information is then transferred to the brain? If the lid actually is covering the pupil, then we worry about amblyopia developing. If the pupil is still visible when a child is looking, typically you're not going to expect amblyopia to develop. Cataracts also would be something we worry about because what it would do is prevent the light from entering the eye, once again causing disuse or non-use of the eye, leading to poorer vision. The majority of amblyopia, however, is the result of uncorrected refractive error or strabismus. Those are the two primary reasons that we are, are finding amblyopia occurring. So one of, one of the misnomers that was out for a long time is that amblyopia typically only affects one eye. That is not true, but it occurs mostly a majority of the cases in one eye. But it can affect both eyes in children that have a high amount of uncorrected refractive error in both eyes. The effect can be anywhere from mild to moderate to severe. So somebody could have a visual acuity reduced from 2020 to 2040 or as poor as 2200. And that information would certainly affect what our treatment options would be. Children who have amblyopia typically don't realize that they do. If it's monocular, then you usually they see quite well out of the other eyes, so you're not going to be able to identify from a child that there's a problem unless you screen for it specifically. And if it's binocular, oftentimes children with reduced vision in both eyes think, that, think everybody sees things exactly the same way they do. So typically children are not going to complain that they have any amblyopia. We know that the, the magnitude of amblyopia varies from mild to severe, and it also affects how we decide to treat the child. The most common treatment for amblyopia is typically the appropriate correction with either glasses or contact lenses. If the refractive correction is equal in both eyes, glasses are probably the best way to get started. But there are some cases where a child may be very nearsighted in one eye and basically have minimal or no prescription in the other. Then, cases like that, we oftentimes would suggest contact lenses as the first line. There are other treatments for lazy eyes, uh, and they include patching, atropine, and eye exercises. When you do patching or atropine, the purpose of those types of treatments are really to cover the better seeing eye and force the child to use the lazy eye or the amblyopic eye. It doesn't always lead to happy situations. Children are, are now being, having one eye covered where they used to rely on that eye and may have very difficult times getting around or resolving small details. In cases where it is severe amblyopia, those kinds of patching experiences need to take place in safe environments. Very important in the classroom that uh, it is understood that if a child is going to be patched in the classroom, that they are in a safe environment. You're not going to send them out to the playground and ride a bicycle or put them on the monkey bar. If patching is part of the treatment, and the treatment would be in, a, in addition to the classes, Current research is actually different than what it was 20 years ago. It used to be suggested that a child's better eye be patched all day. That is not the current mode of treatment. In mild or moderate amblyopia, typically we only suggest between two and three hours. In more severe cases, we extend it to six hours. It's very important that while the child is patched, that they're engaged in something that forces the poor seeing or the amblyopic eye to actually be doing some work. I don't want them doing things like watching television where they can just veg out and not be able to force that eye to really see what's going on on the television. So we're very specific about making some recommendations when the eye is patched. There are lots of challenges in, to ensure that a child actually follows the recommendations made by the eye doctor. Number one, 
in kids who see really well out of their other eye, they just don't understand why am I wearing glasses. And I see just as well without them as I see with them. So there needs to be a lot of support and encouragement to wear the glasses as prescribed. And typically, it's all the time with the amblyopia. The other thing is, if the patching is taking place in, in the Head Start or a preschool program, it's very important that an adult be aware of how long the child should patch and to monitor the child. Because, because they see so much better out of their better seeing eye, it's very typical for them to want to peek around the patch. Um, adhesive patches oftentimes are very successful, but not always the way that it, uh, parents want to work. Some kids react to the adhesive on the patch. When uh, they have glasses and they put patches over it, it's very easy for the child to look over or under the glasses. So it's really challenging to, to uh, patch a child in an environment where the adult who's observing the child has other kids to watch. But it really does make it a more successful program. The other thing that's very common is strabismus. Strabismus is basically when the two eyes are not pointing at the same object. One eye is either turned in or out or up or down. Prevalence is, once again, relatively small in children who don't have complications. And we'll talk about that in a second. But it can range as high as 53% when you're talking about kids with special health care needs. And when we refer to those high-risk kids, we're talking about people with neurodevelopmental problems, those that have complicated prenatal or birth history, children who've experienced trauma. So there's a multitude of things that could lead to a higher chance of a child having the business. There's also the situation where uh, a child might have the business because of uncorrected refractive error. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. These two are examples of the most common types of strabismus. The one where the child's eye is turned in, and that's called esotropia, or the one where one eye turns out, and that's called exotropia. In hypertropia, one eye is usually turned slightly higher than the other eye when you look at it. One, one thing I, I caution you, though, is many children who do not have fully developed bridges may give you the impression of an eye turn in, but actually their eyes are straight. The problem is that it appears that way because the nasal part uh, of the eye, the pupil is closer to the tissue or the skin and gives you the impression that one eye is turning in. So sometimes there's something called pseudoesotropia. So if you refer a child to a doctor and nothing's done, it may be associated with the fact that it's not really strabismus. It just looks like it, and the child will grow up. So we know that strabismus can actually present in many ways. We know it, the direction can change. But we also know that sometimes it could be one eye that turns, or the child can actually alternate from one to the other. So when you look at them one moment, it looks like the left eye is turning out. When you look at them the next moment, it looks like the right eye. In addition, it can complicate it even more that sometimes the eyes may be straight, while other times one of the eyes is turning. Those three things will influence how the, how the child is treated. So it's most common uh, for strabismus to affect one eye and lead to amblyopia. So those are the ones we worry about for lazy eye. It's not uncommon to have strabismus and amblyopia together. The treatments for strabismus are often dependent on all of the first three factors. What direction? Do they alternate? Is it present all the time? And the options for treatment include sometimes simply glasses. Children with, a, with an eye turn in, oftentimes when you put the correction on for uncorrected farsightedness, you'll, you'll see that immediately the eyes look much straighter. Take the glasses off and the eye turns in again. Those, we need to make sure they wear glasses all the time. Other treatment options including patching, surgery, vision therapy or orthoptics, or sometimes what we'll do is we'll just watch the child for a little while and sometimes the strabismus will resolve on its own. The last thing that I wanted to talk about was significant refractive errors. These are the things that we talk about all the time, myopia or, or nearsightedness, hyperopia or farsightedness or astigmatism. Typically, in the majority of the cases, both eyes are somewhat equal in the amounts of refractive error. Most times, 
you can put the glasses on and children will automatically begin to see a little better, but that isn't always the case. The other thing is sometimes there may be refractive errors and we choose not to correct them right away. And the reason we do that is there's a lot of development in the children's eyes that goes on. Majority of it is in the first six years of life. There's still some growing that goes on beyond that. So if I have a preschool child that I'm seeing a little bit of nearsightedness, the likelihood is that I'm not going to correct that child until a little later on. So I would like to ensure that normal visual development is allowed to occur. So, so just because a child failed the screening, sometimes I might take that wait and see type of approach because it may be something that they'll grow out of. The three types, oh, I want too many, sorry. So let's go through the three types in just a little detail. I don't want to bore you, but I just wanted to clarify some things. Myopia or nearsightedness is a situation where things are blurry far away. Oftentimes, if you are watching a movie, the kids want to get closer to it in order to see it better. Typically, near vision is actually normal or fine unless they have a very high amount of myopia. Prescribing for myopia really depends on the amount of myopia I see, the age of the child, and the posture of the eye. And as I just said, sometimes it's better to watch. Um, typically, in high myopia, you will see the kids sit almost on top of the TV and bring looks very close. I put this image here because typically we look at the nearsighted eye as one that has a lot of power. And we always want the image to focus on the retina or the back of the eye and the image actually focuses in front of the eye, allowing a blurred image on the retina. And when you put glasses on, basically what happens is the image is now brought back to the retina, so it provides a nice, clear image. Hyperopia, or farsightedness, is, is what we always look at as a little bit opposite of myopia. Kids typically can see pretty well far away, but up close it may be a little bit more challenged. Sometimes they actually can see 20-20, both far and near, and have a significant amount of farsightedness. But what happens is they're walking and they're focusing all the time so that uh, they're actually working really hard to see things up close. Kids like this oftentimes will resist doing close work and start to act out, complain of headaches, their eyes will be tearing. Those are the kinds of kids who are always falling off their chairs or trying to be the class clowns because they just can't focus for any length of time at, at near point tasks. Significant amounts of farsightedness actually do lead to esotropia, the eye turn, that turns in. And they're the kids that once you put those glasses on, the eye straighten out. Very important that we encourage them to keep their glasses on. And if you see that the glasses have broken, encourage the family to get them replaced as soon as possible. Very important. The last type is astigmatism. Um, astigmatism is a bit different. It doesn't just affect one distance. Typically in astigmatism, it affects both distance and near task relatively equally. Though you might have astigmatism in combination with nearsightedness or farsightedness. Children with, with a significant amount of astigmatism oftentimes will always appear as if they're squinting because what happens is they make the pupil so it's like a pinpoint and it allows them to get a clearer image. Instead of having two blurred images focusing on the retina, they move it so there's one pinpoint image on the retina. There are certain subgroups that have a higher chance of having astigmatism. Some of those include some Native American Indians. And another group is certain Hispanic subgroups have a very high amount of astigmatism. The challenge is when it's present in a large amount, if it's uncorrected, it can lead to amblyopia. Oftentimes it's missed in screenings and we want to make sure that when screenings take place, you watch that the child's not squinting. They're so used to doing it to see clearly, but in order to get an accurate assessment of what they're, what they're capable of, you want to make sure they're not squinting. In order to improve the vision and astigmatism, you want to make sure the children wear their glasses. When they first put it on, the world seems turned upside down. Floors seem tilted and so do walls. In order for that to go away and for them to feel comfortable, 
They need to wear their glasses all the time. Once again, you want these children to get their glasses replaced if they're broken or scratched or they're lost. Very important to encourage parents to follow through. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about are the some of the some of the other things. Whoops. Some of the other things that uh, you might see in uh, children's vision. Oops. My arrow is not going up, so I can talk without the, without my slide. Uh, cataracts uh, are something that does occur in children. Oftentimes, you'll find it as a result of trauma to the eye. Um, the most important thing is when it's there that it's addressed as early as possible because it will lead to to uh, amblyopia. The reality is it doesn't occur very often. Color vision is something that occurs in six to eight out of every hundred males. So if you have a child that's got some confusion, strongly encourage them to go get the child's vision checked. Pink eye or conjunctivitis I threw in here because we're always worried about the contagiousness of bacterial or viral conjunctivitis. Certainly is a problem. But there are some conjunctivitis that are not contagious and those are allergic. Very important, though, to get the child uh, referred out. Eye movement problems are often things that we worry about with kids when they lose their place all the time. Um, if you are thinking that, it might be the fact that they alternate between two eyes if there's an eye turn, or they do have a problem with, with fixation and, and moving their eyes. Kids with cerebral palsy oftentimes have eye movement problems because of the motor skill issue. And the last thing is, significant eye health problems, retinal, corneal, optic nerve. It can happen to any part of the eye. But these are less common vision problems and probably ones that the parents will be alerted to through the well child exam that the pediatrician has created, done and hopefully referred out. Okay, I'm going to turn this, uh, the, the slides over now to Dr. Stacy Lyons. <laughs> And okay, my down arrows. Stacy, it's all yours. I don't have it. Let's see. There we go. Um, thank you so much, Sandy, um, and thank you for allowing me to participate um, in this year of children's vision. Today I'm going to speak about finding solutions to improve access to eye care. Now a vision screening is made up of a few tests that help identify those children who are most at risk of having potential vision problems. And it's not diagnostic. A good vision pr screening program is very labor intensive, but with early detection and treatment can improve the outcome for most vision problems in children. In Head Start, having a 45-day federal mandate adds another host of challenges to this vision screening program. As Sandy said, vision disorders in preschoolers are the fourth most common disability in the United States. It's the most handicapping, prevalent handicapping condition in childhood. And again, however, children do not know what they should see. How a child sees is what's normal to them. And because of this, they rarely complain about vision issues. And vision issues don't hurt. I believe a picture is worth a thousand words. How does this particular child navigate the school library? A vision screening is often the entry point into vision, a vision care continuum. So a vision program involves a complete spectrum of care. This includes screening, comprehensive treat care, treatment, and as Sandy described, which may be eyeglasses or patching or surgery, and it includes an education piece. Plan and support requires good communication 
with the network of advocates that a child has in order for the treatment to be successful. For example, the eye doctor must communicate with the Head Start health managers, who would then communicate with the teachers and social workers so the Head Start community can support a child in wearing their glasses properly at school. This is an integral piece of this process for compliance, which brings us back to ongoing care. I'm going to come back to this in just a few minutes. An eye exam diagnoses eye disorders and diseases and prescribes treatment. And this is performed by an optometrist or ophthalmologist. Included in this evaluation are the things Sandy just discussed, refractive state, an ocular health evaluation, assessment of eye movements and alignment, and color vision testing. Children who should have a comprehensive eye exam are children who have failed the vision screening, or if they display signs of vision problems, and included in this, if a child has a systemic condition which has associated eye sequelae, such as diabetes or rheumat juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. If there are any concerns about reaching developmental milestones or concerns about reading or learning or performance at school, these children should have a comprehensive eye exam as well. Since the children congregate, with the Head Start community all day long, you are an essential part in having first-hand knowledge of this information and are an integral part of this process. Now if we look at this diagram again, each of these arrows represent potential gaps in this vision care continuum. It's important that we work together to close these gaps. In looking at some national research studies about reasons why follow-up exams do not occur, the national average for turnaround time between failed vision screening and access to comprehensive eye care is reported at about 18 months. 18 months seems like a long time that can encompass as much as two full school years. Another study reports that 40 to 65 percent of children do not access follow-up comprehensive vision care after school vision screening referral. And there is a gap, the gap is larger for children of ethnic minorities. There are many studies that look at what are the barriers to care and treatment. Knowledge seems to be the first one that's always listed. Knowledge of the difference between screening and comprehensive care. What are the potential impact of vision problems as related to learning? Are there awarenesses of resources or lack of knowledge of where to go for an exam? or difficulty navigating the complex health care system that we live in. Cost. What is the cost of an eye exam? Can I afford it? Do I have insurance that covers the cost of an eye exam? Are glasses covered under my insurance? And if not, how much do glasses cost? This is a daunting thing for many parents. And time and transportation. What are the, does an eye care provider have hours that are convenient for my schedule? Is the provider easily accessible by public transportation? And then trust. Lack of trust in the screening results or in health care in general. Language and culture comes into play as well. 
does the eye care provider or the office where the eye care provider is, do they speak my native language? Is there someone who can potentially translate for me? Or do they understand my culture? All of these things, it's very important that we explore the reasons that individual families are non-compliant in getting to their eye exam. Understanding these barriers help develop community-based solutions that increase compliance and remove the challenges of getting to follow-up examinations. When thinking about potential solutions to these barriers, I think about materials that I provide to my patients. These materials may be ones that I develop myself or ones that I might acquire from other sources. These materials should be easy to read. It should use plain, non-medical language and should be translated to patients into their native language. Information needs to be provided to increase compliance of follow-up exams. Information to explain vision screening process and maybe the part of the screening that the child did not pass. Explain implications of vision problems, as Sandy just did, to parents, guardians, teachers, social workers, and health care managers. Um, we need to provide lists of area service providers, as well as financial and transportation assistance information to parents. This information often takes some time to gather and needs frequent updating. Face-to-face -face meetings and education are usually the best way to convey this information. So this way a conversation can occur and questions can be answered. Increasing compliance with community providers. We need to become familiar with what are the community resources that are available. How do we build partnership with providers that maybe can um, give some of this education to our community? And how to explore options and creative options for service delivery. I'm going to explain an example of what we did here in Boston. The on-site mobile clinic was developed by the New England College of Optometry. We actually started our relationship with Head Start in 1989 providing vision screening with Head Start. On October 14, 2010, which just happened to be World Sight Day that year, we rolled out the on-site mobile clinic to deliver comprehensive vision care at Head Start sites in Boston and surrounding towns. The on-site mobile van offers access to all children. We accept most insurances, and through its affordable eye care program, no child will be turned away for inability to pay. Eyeglasses are provided as well and are delivered back to the child at their Head Start site once they are fabricated. In order to improve the plan and support portion of the continuum, Dr. Katherine Johnson from the New England College of Optometry, who is the project director, Kathy Mazu, the Northeast Regional Director of Prevent Blindness America, Corinne Mataroja, who was the ABCD Head Start Health Service Director, and myself developed and implemented this community program to support school-based care of prescribed treatment plans for children with vision conditions. However, this program could not have developed or been implemented without the collaboration, commitment, and the incredible energy of the ABCD Head Start Health, um, ABC Head Start community in Boston. This was a grant, a 2011 Healthy Eyes, Healthy People State Association grant in Massachusetts. 
The components of this program included a vision action plan, which I'll explain in a moment, two pairs of glasses for each child, individual education cards, education that was provided to the Health Start managers, staff, as well as the families of the children with vision conditions. Consultation um, was available to the Head Start health managers, staff, and families as well, as well as a compliance track tracker, which was used for evaluation. This compliance tracker was housed in the Head Start classrooms and filled out by the classroom teachers daily. In many of the classrooms, this became part of the morning activities. First weather was done, and then our vision compliance tracker. Condition-specific education cards were developed and distributed to parents and teachers of all the children enrolled in ABCD Boston Head Start who was diagnosed with vision conditions, and they were available in English, Spanish, Chinese, and Haitian Creole. On the back of each of these cards were frequently asked questions, such as, what do you do if a child's glasses break? How do I access another pair of eyeglasses? All children who were enrolled in this program with diagnosed vision conditions had a vision action plan that was completed for them. It was signed by the parent, health manager, as well as the eye doctor. This vision action plan included information regarding diagnosis, treatment plan, and follow-up, and became part of the child's individual health plan. The individual health plan was an already established method of documenting and supporting action plans for health conditions such as asthma and diabetes. And this is supported by the case manager assigned to each family at Head Start. Previously, the individual health plan did not include any information about vision. We looked at results of the Eyes That Thrived program, and the results from the compliance tractor showed that children were wearing their glasses 93% of the total days that this was tracked. We also interviewed health care managers of these pilot sites that we piloted this program at. The health managers mentioned that the mo it was very satisfying for them to hear reports from teachers that the Eyes That Thrive students showed improvement in behaviors and acquisition of skills, and they were developing a lot better after diagnosis and treatment. The teachers felt that this vision action plan was a good communication tool, and it gave valued information. The compliance tractor allowed teachers and children to engage in activity around this vision action plan. And the parents, there was some mixed response regarding this. They resisted the diagnosis. Sometimes they were frustrated when glasses broke or were not available to them, or they were extremely excited or grateful for this program. Looking at impact of a total program, um, research was presented at the American Public Health Association annual meeting last November. It looked at impact of integrated health interventions on follow-up care for children who failed vision screening in Head Start programs in Boston. The 
the aim of this study was to evaluate the impact of the integrated vision health interventions on follow-up care for children who failed the Head Start screenings. They looked at data from two school years to evaluate the follow-up for children who failed the vision screening. In 2007 and 2008, before the on-site mobile van rolled out or the Eyes That Thrive program was developed and implemented, as well as 2011 and 2012 after these programs were instituted. And what they found is that in both of those years, all the children enrolled in Head Start had their vision screening within that 45 days of entry as the federal mandate um, is given. In 2007 and 2008, there were 572 children who failed the vision screening and were referred to follow-up care. Only 14% of them received timely eye examinations. Yet after the Eyes That Thrive program was implemented, as well as the on-site mobile van was rolled out, in 2011 and 2012, 419 children failed the vision screening. All of the children, all 419 children, received timely eye exams and treatment. So we were able to use this program to show that we can increase access to eye examinations and treatment. And we did this by parent awareness, staff awareness, and pediat of pediatric vision issues. And that the development of community-based solutions resulted in timely follow-up care for all referred children. And as I said, the, the commitment um, on the part of Head Start was just amazing. So I'd like to thank you again for allowing me to participate in this year of children's vision. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Lyons. That was wonderful information. And uh, as we get control turned back over here, there we go, um, I just want to remind everybody that's listening, if you have questions for Dr. Watt or Dr. Lyons so far, please go ahead and type those into um, the question box on your panel so that we can consider those in the Q&A session that will follow my presentation. There you go. Okay. So I just want to talk a little bit this afternoon about evaluating your vision health program. Um, Dr. Block talked so far about the importance of healthy vision for children's learning and uh, key issues to consider with parents and help them understand as children are going through treatment uh, for various different health conditions. And uh, Dr. Lyons talked about the importance of engaging a community of individuals for uh, improving vision health and treatment adherence. So I want to talk a little bit about um, evaluating your, your total vision health system um, and, and why that would be important for you. Uh, a lot of the individuals consider the vision screening, the, the, the vision component of their vision health system. And really, that it goes beyond much more than that. There, there are several different pieces that build up that foundation of healthy vision for young children, um, looking at issues such as the, the vision screening tools that you use. Are they current? Are they valid and age appropriate? Um, how is training and certification approach within the staff or even the contractors that you might use for vision screening within your early education program? Um, is the program um, have adequate sensitivity and specificity? Is it referring the right kids and not over referring too many kids that may not have a vision issue? Um, how are parents engaged in ensuring the vision health of children? And how are key stakeholders in the community 
engaged and educated about what's happening in the vision health of the children that you serve. So there's a lot of different pieces to look at um, for a, a full vision health program. So I just want to go through and highlight some of the key issues to be taking a look at and questions to ask yourself about your own vision health system. So the first area to look at is um, take a moment to compare the screening results that you have to the eye exam outcomes of those children that receive that follow-up to care. Um, and, and take a look at that along the lines of the, the different screeners of your program, um, perhaps if you're using different kinds of tools to screen different age groups. So break that data down and really look at it in different ways to make sure that there isn't an overly high rate of referrals in one area. Um, and make sure that your sensitivity and specificity is really along uh, appropriate lines. So what does that mean, specificity and sensitivity? You see them highlighted there in red. So specificity is when you have an appropriate percentage of children that have a condition that are referred on to care. So you're looking for those kids that do have a vision problem. Um, so for example, if your specificity was 70%, you'd be referring 70% of the children with a vision condition on um, and then missing 30 out of that 100 um, for those that would have a condition. So you obviously want to have a, a higher rate of specificity. And sensitivity is, is also something you want to be looking at. So if you're not referring on children that don't have a vision issue. So if you have a sensitivity of 80%, um, then you would be correctly not referring 80 out of 100 children, but then you may refer on 20 out of that 100 who really don't have a vision issue. So obviously you want to make sure that your specificity and your sensitivity are high on both ends to make sure you're referring the kids that need it, but not over-referring kids that don't have a vision problem. Um, and there are national organizations out there that help to identify proper sensitivity and specificities for vision screening. Um, so you want to check with uh, those national organizations. The National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health can help you identify those right specificities and sensitivities for you. Or connect with a local optometrist or ophthalmologist to help find the right um, referral rate for your screening program. It's also important to, on an annual basis, look at the vision screening tools that you're using. Are they in good working order? Is uh, software up to date in the case where you might be using a vision screening instrument? And also, is your vision screening setting appropriate for the kinds of tools that you're using? So for example, if you do a chart-based or, or uh, acuity-based card uh, screening in your program, take a look at the tools themselves. Are they clean? Are they in good condition? Sometimes those, those charts can get yellowed or broken or cracked because of, they're old and dried out. Um, so make sure that the tools that you're using are in good condition. Um, also consider where you're doing the vision screening. Um, are they lit appropriately, free of distraction, um, at age-appropriate distances for the tools that you're using, uh, which can come in a variety of different lengths. There are some out there that are appropriate for 10 feet, some for 5 feet. And if you're using a vision screening instrument, you can be even closer than that. So make sure that the areas you're using are appropriate and really not loud and echoey. For example, it may not be appropriate to be vision screening in a gym as opposed to a quieter classroom or a resource room within your program. Also look at the vision screening instrument yourself if you do have that um, approach within your program. Um, vision screening instrument software uh, is typically updated on a fairly regular basis, so you need to make sure, you know, check with the, the company where you purchased your instrument and make sure that it's up to date, um, that it's not due for calibration, and that you're using age-appropriate referral criteria within that screening device. Um, again, there's a national organization to look at the right referral criteria for different age groups. So you want to make sure that you're using the right one at the right age that you're screening. And it's not just the charts and the, the instruments themselves you need to take a look at. You need to make sure your screening accessories are in good working order. Um, if you use an instrument, you want to make sure that you have all of your batteries charged um, and, and backup batteries ready to go. Your occluders are age appropriate um, and in good order. For example, if you have the, the occluder glasses that have the animals on either side, make sure that those haven't been broken off or ripped so the child could then peek around it. Another area of your vision health program to look at is how staff is trained and certified. And is it current? 
Um, staff should be trained and certified by a nationally recognized organization, such as Prevent Blindness, or within your own state. You may have a state agency assigned to uh, vision screening training for your programs. That might be a Department of Public Health, for example. Um, you want to make sure staff training and certification is kept up to date. Typically, you want to look to recertify your vision screeners about every three to five years. And these are important points to check out with those you may contract for your vision screening services as well. Um, have they gone through a formal program to receive uh, training and certification? Have they maintained that information and kept themselves educated about children's vision over the years? Now, a training uh, really should include, at a minimum, an overview of children's vision problems and make sure that the, it goes over the, the age and appropriate, uh, age and developmentally appropriate screening tools and techniques. Uh, there are some different approaches for children that are, you know, three and four as opposed to older children, um, five, six. So you really want to make sure that what you're looking at is age appropriate. And make sure that uh, the training program includes an educational component as well as a follow-up component because really no screening is complete until you have that follow-up component ensured in. Also, you want to make sure that as you go through and you look at the professional development plans of your staffing, that that vision screening training and certification is marked and tracked in there. So that if somebody is coming due for recertification, you can take a moment to notify them. Another important point um, is to make sure that you review your vision health program results annually with your parents or health advisory committees to make sure that you're identifying some of those needs um, that exist within families that you're serving, barriers to follow-up care, and possible community solutions. And Dr. Lyons alluded to this in her presentation as well, is that your screening, your, your approach within your own program um, really needs to be re representing one stakeholder within a community of individuals that care about the vision health of the children that you serve. Um, so make sure that you're working with your advisory committees that represent other stakeholders that care about those vision health to make sure that all the different components are kept up to date. So review your equipment and screener certifications. Is there additional education needed that maybe some of your advisory committee members can help you identify? Um, review your screening and referral rates. Maybe you're seeing trends um, in some children who are, are not being referred. And then along the same lines, look at those rate of follow-up to eye care. Are you seeing trends of children that are not able to connect with eye care? Um, are they children of families who maybe uh, speak English as a second language or are different um, socioeconomic statuses that really are creating some barriers that you need to take a moment and say, okay, how can we address the vision health needs of this specific group that we serve? Um, and, and through the work with your health advisory committees or other members of the community, Seek some solutions to that because just giving referral after referral is obviously not going to take care of that barrier that the family is experiencing. Also, it's important to take a look at your referral and educational materials that you have to make sure it's really meeting the, the cultural competency needs, the literacy level needs of the families that you serve. Uh, it's wonderful to have a strong screening program where individuals are trained well. But if at the end of the day a child is referred and the only information that you can give to families is in English and that is not their native language, um, then that's creating a barrier. Also, as uh, Dr. Lyons mentioned, I believe that there are some trust issues. Some cultures or individuals may feel that staff from the, the program may be intimidating. So maybe there's a peer program that may need to help reach out to some of these families. They're experiencing barriers to follow up the care to help overcome some of those cultural issues or socioeconomic issues. Um, that, that perhaps a peer could uh, address with that family. And then take a moment to report the end of year data to other key stakeholders in the community, health departments, educators, um, eye care providers, primary care providers, help them understand what's happening with the populations that you serve. They may see, be seeing similar trends within their own groups, or you may help to bring an issue to them that they were not aware of, and they may have some resources that can help to address that issue. Um, so if you see a trend within a certain segment of your population where they're not able to access care, um, perhaps the state health department can help make some connections to primary care providers or eye care providers or, or take down some of those barriers where they have resources to do that and you may not. So take a moment to share your story with other members of the community that are also experiencing that 
and uh, make sure that you're aware of what resources they have that you can then leverage to help better serve the families um, that you reach. And thank you for taking a moment to uh, talk with me a little bit about evaluation. I do want to encourage everyone to, uh, again, go to the Year Children's Vision website. You'll receive that link in the follow-up email after today's presentation. But also, I want to remind individuals that uh, if you have questions, go ahead and type those into the chat box now so that our question organizer can get those into the queue. I'm going to give her a couple minutes here. Another couple of reminders um, from today's presentation, you will receive a link to the copies of the slide and the recording, and also a certificate of uh, participation. We aren't able to offer CEUs directly, but we do hope that certificate of participation uh, can be used with your professional associations to recognize your participation in today's webinar. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Chaplin for the question and answer portion. Okay, thank you, Kara. Um, some great questions coming in. Um, one of the qu I'm receiving several questions, and Dr. Block, you may want to take these questions. The, um, folks are wanting to know what to do in the birth to three population for early Head Start, for example. How to introduce these um, this information today to that program what they should be doing, and is doing a simple fix and uh, follow test sufficient? So there's a lot of discussion about what is appropriate to the birth to three. There is very little research currently out in that age group. There are a number of instrument-based uh, screeners that are out, but the data is still not sufficient to make a recommendation for them. Fix and follow really is very crude, and I strongly encourage if there is a concern that the child is not attending or does not seem to be developmentally appropriate visually, then that child should immediately be referred. Unfortunately, there are no good qualified vision screening instruments that are successfully uh, reviewed at this point in time, but that is the National Expert Panel is is taking this on um, in our next meeting in August to try to see if we can identify something that we can make concrete recommendations. So that's sort of like sidestepping the real question, but it's the best I could do. Stacy, do you Thanks. have anything to add? No, I, I don't have anything to add from what you said, but I think this is the next area that we will be looking at. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lyons, I have a question from someone who says even in a school-based health clinic, um, they struggle with getting parents to complete the paperwork to refer their children to the, the pediatric ophthalmology clinic. They provide lots of information to parents written on a fifth grade level in the two primary languages, English and Spanish, but they deal with more than 200 languages in their school district. Um, they have limited resources. Want to know if you can offer any advice on getting parents to understand the importance to be uh, to have that follow-up eye exam, even when uh, there's no cost for the eye exam or glasses. So they're just struggling, it seems to me, with um, receiving permission. Part of the problem is struggling with receiving permission to have the follow-up eye exam at the school-based health clinic. Can you respond to that? It's one of the most <laughs> difficult. <laughs> it's one of the most difficult barriers that I deal with as well. Um, what I have found um, that has been helpful um, is that continued education, and I can't stress it enough. Um, a few weeks ago, I actually participated in a health fair that was done in eight languages and went to each room where a translator um, translated what I was saying in eight languages. So it felt a little like uh, it was very interesting. Um, but the more education that parents have um, in their own language, um, in their own cultural, um, is better. Um, what I have found, an interesting thing that I found um, fairly recently is that we were working with a Cambodian population 
and notices in their languages kept being sent home in backpacks. But this community doesn't know from backpacks from notices being sent home. So I wound up doing a TV show um, where it was translated into their language and they watched this community-based TV show um, which got the consents flowing uh, more. So it's really finding what is the community-based solution and there may be many community-based solutions um, in one area. I hope I didn't skirt that question too much. <laughs> now that was, that was great information, thank you. Kira, um, where can um, attendees find places um, that will provide vision certification, vision screening certification? Uh, they can go to uh, preventblindness.org and um, just probably the best approach is to email us with your location so that it may be one of our state affiliate programs that help to connect you with that or um, one of our certified trainers that works with you to come to your location um, to get you trained. Um, like I said, there may be some cases where it's the, the State Department of Public Health by public health rule has um, jurisdiction for training, so it really just does depend on location. Um, so my email will be out with the link to the webinar, so they can always email me directly or go to preventblindness.org and uh, we can work with you to find the right connection. Thank you. Dr. Lyons, um, some of the attendees would love to have copies of the documents you were referring to in your section. Is there a way that they, like the, the vision action plan and so forth, is there a way that they can receive copies? They can. Um, Kira, I'm going to hand this to you because I think you know where it's located. <laughs> yeah, our, um, the Prevent Blindness has been working to put this together as a national um, package that the challenge is just to make sure that as you look at using the iSupply program, to make sure you have all the partners in place. Um, so again, I'm going to use the, the same resource. You can either email me or go to preventblindness.org and send a request that way. But um, using iSup Thrive really depends on making sure you have all the partners in place, making sure there's access to eye care, confirming that, and then working with individuals on that education piece. Um, along with that comes the other documents that we mentioned, the, the vision tracker, the educational materials. It all goes with that package. So. Um, we really would like to work with individuals to make sure they have the right partners in place to use all the pieces of that system. So just, uh, again, go to preventblindness.org and, and send a message that way or email me from a link that will be provided. Thank you. Um, Dr. Block, I have three questions that are related. One, um, what would be the referral criteria for pre-K through grade 12 the second one is how often children should be screened in that same population, pre-K through grade 12. And the third part of that question is what pieces of vision screening should occur during that time? Like you may do some tests in pre-K that you may not do in grade 12, for example. Okay, so that's an awful lot of information. Um, I know. <laughs> and and typically, um, if you go to the Prevent Blindness site, there'll be information as to what the appropriate visual acuity cutoff should be in the different age groups. Typically, for three-year-olds, your visual acuity cutoff is not the same as it would be for a school-age child. And I believe school-age children is predominantly 20, 40 in either eye. All vision screenings include some form of visual acuity test. Depending on the age, we'll determine what distance that takes place. In the three-year-old, it's probably five feet. In the in the uh, six to uh, or the four, four, five, and six-year-old, it's probably ten feet. The reality is that when you get to an older child, it should be done at a full uh, twenty-foot working distance or simulating a twenty-foot working distance. I, while it is not universally accepted. I feel that in any school-age child, you should assess whether they can see well up close with each eye. That is not part of the recommended vision screening protocol. Um, I also think that uh, at some point in time, a child's color vision should be assessed. That is not uh, uh, recommended typically for any vision screening, but 
In some states, it would be nice for um, the state of Illinois requires children entering school for the first time to have a comprehensive eye exam and color vision testing would be part of that. Vision screenings should focus on the ages where you would be most likely to pick up vision problems. Certainly, in a three-year-old uh, preschooler, you're looking for those amblyogenic factors, very high amounts of refractive error, eye turns, things like that. In the, the school-age child, you are looking to make sure their vision is sufficient to be able to work in a classroom situation. They can see well far away. They can see up close well. So that's like a, a five- or six-year-old level. Nearsightedness or myopia usually shows up at about the age of 8 to 10. So vision screenings at that point in time would be very valuable. The other age that really is important to really look at, especially for distance vision, is as they start to begin the driver's ed program. You want to make sure that children who are being put behind the wheel actually are capable of seeing well when they're driving. So we know that there's lots of people out on the street that don't see very well. I keep telling my patients, if they're out there, let me know, and I'm going to get off the street. So <laughs> You know, there, there, there are lots of other things that can be included in screenings. Um, some form of test of binocularity is very typically used for preschool age children. The stereo smile test is the most well accepted program for the preschool age child. When you get to an older child, you can go to a little bit more sophisticated test of binocularity. Cover testing is, has been recommended, but I am not an advocate of that for a screening situation unless you have an eye care provider participating. And I think that any type, type of screening should include some historical perspective. So is there a history of vision problems, any health issues, any family history? Those things would all be part of a screening at any age. So hopefully I've addressed all three questions. It's a lot of information. Excellent. Those excellent responses. Thank you. And let me give you a follow-up on that. Um, you mentioned color. Someone wants to know if anything can be done for color vision deficiency. And then I would like to also add questions that I receive from the field often, and that is if you're doing a vision screening with several components and they do not pass the color vision deficiency piece only, um, should a referral be made for an eye exam? So color vision problems are very common. It's not a disease. It's something that runs in families. You know, there are some people who have been pushing for these contact lenses that will correct it. There's nothing that really corrects the color vision problem. The most important piece is education because you want to make sure if someone has a color vision deficit, they don't think they're going to be a pilot because there's, or an electrician because there's certain jobs that require normal color vision. So it's more of an educational piece. Is it something to refer pers a person for on eye exam? Probably not. Um, it's more for an education component. If somebody can diagnose a color vision deficit, I think that once you get the diagnosis and understand the limitations or, or, or the modifications that you might need, because something like the, the stoplights, need, you need to understand the location of the light versus what colors they are. Once they understand that, I don't think the eye exam is going to make a difference. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lyons, I have a question wanting to know your thoughts about vision screen, oh, excuse me, about vision therapy by a behavioral optometrist and why will insurance not cover that service? Um, <laughs> The uh, vision therapy in many uh, insurances is covered um, by insurance. Um, vision therapy is a very effective um, way of treating certain diagnoses, such as convergence insufficiency, um, as well as ocular motor um, and accommodative dysfunctions. Um, so um, I think it is a very efficacious um, treatment for certain diagnoses as well as in covered by many insurances. Thank you. Um, this can be for both you and 
Dr. Block, is there any reason when doing vision screening to screen with both eyes open instead of instead of doing only one eye at a time? Stacey, you can go first. <laughs> um, each eye separate is fine. Oftentimes I find that if I start with both eyes together, then I'm building a rapport, um, and then the glasses in a young preschool population sometimes add another dimension. Um, so oftentimes I will um, do both eyes together first and then add the fun occluder glasses and do each eye separately. The only thing I might add is in children with special needs and any type of resistance to somebody in their body space, that may be the only way to get any type of visual acuity testing done. Exactly. So, so it's better than nothing. Okay. Um, we are at 346, so we need to wrap this up. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask another question, um, Dr. Block. Is this directive regarding eye exams relative to daycares also or just school-based programs? Directive? What directive? Um, this information about how to get children to an eye exam or the, the importance of having an eye exam. Is, that, is this information today for school-based programs or would this also apply to daycare center to do vision screening? Would this Absolutely information be? Applied to anybody out there. So we may be talking about Head Start or preschool or, or school-based programs, but this really applies to all children. Okay. And then I have questions from folks who like the idea of the travel traveling van and how can they find out if there's such an, a, a program in their state? Would they contact Lions Clubs maybe? Um, I would think the Lions Club is one way to start. Um, I don't know if there's a directory of mobile vans in each state. Um, I know that um, there are a few uh, football teams, such as the Eagles and the Tampa Bay team, that both have mobile vans as well. Um, but I don't know if there's a directory of, the, of mobile clinics. Lions Club might be a great start. I think the VSP programs really do come from a variety of different sources, so it may be a college of optometry. Um, Alliance Club in the community, also Vision Service Plan, uh, nationally has two vans that, that travel as well as um, Luxottica or Lunch Crafters sometimes has traveling vans as well, but so really is driven by a community source. Okay. Um, if a child does not pass vision screening, Kira, you may want to answer this based on what's coming out of the National Center. If a child does not pass vision screening, should another vision screen be done before making the eye exam? And if so, how soon after the first um, vision yeah. screening that they didn't pass? Yeah, the child didn't pass the screening or wasn't able to complete the screening the first time around, but they're likely to. You know, maybe the child was tired or hungry or um, it just wasn't feeling well that day. You know, do try to rescreen within as soon as possible or within six months. Um, but if the child's not likely to pass another screening, then go ahead and make that referral. Um, you know, don't don't wait for delay of treatment. Let a, a professional eye care provider take a look at that child. If they're not likely to pass another screening, go ahead and make that referral. So if you do think they can complete it again, try to do it within um, six months or less. Really, you know, the the same day or as soon as possible is preferred. Okay, thank you. Um, if um, this this is both for Doctors Lyons and Block, and Dr. Block, you can go first. Do children who come into Head Start programs already wearing glasses need to be screened for the 45-day mandate, and should they be screened with or without their glasses? I don't know the, the, the 
I don't know if the mandate applies. I thought the mandate applied to any child beginning the Head Start program should mm -hmm. have their vision screen. So I can't, I'm not going to uh, venture a guess on that. They should always be screened with their glasses on because it are, the fact that they're wearing glasses suggests that they already have a vision problem and you want to know if the treatment that they're receiving is adequate. And I'm going to offer a response too based on the conversations that I've had recently with National Head Start Association. Um, they may want to check with the Head Start program itself for the question about whether they're already wearing glasses, do they need to be screened. It may be a question, <coughs> excuse me, that an auditor needs to answer because they may have some specific guidelines around that. But I agree with you that usually it's just within that 45 days all children need to have or at least have collected results in the file um, within the 45 days. Dr. Lyons, did you want to add anything to that? No, just uh, really to make sure that if you are performing a screening on these children that their glasses are on because you would want to know how they're doing with their glasses on. And if let's do a follow-up to that because I hear this question in the field. So you screen a child who's wearing uh, prescription glasses under the care of an eye care professional but may not have had an exam within four years or so and they do not pass the vision screening, you go ahead and make the referral back to their primary um, eye doctor? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then, um, uh, Dr. K? Yes. I apologize, but we um, may get caught off here any moment. So I think we're going to have to wrap it up, although I know we have so many great questions. Um, but what we can do is we will export all the questions and we can do the Q&A summary document again to follow up with for everyone, if that's all right. Does that work right. for you, Kate? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Well, we really appreciate um, everyone attending today. And as we mentioned, we will follow up by email in a couple days. It will take us a couple days to compile all the materials. But in a few days, you'll get that email from us. It's a link to the recorded webinar, the presentation slides, which you can print um, and use however you would like to use. Um, we'll send your certificate of attendance, and we will also include um, the Q&A document and links to the Prevent Blindness website where you can find a lot of additional resources. So thank you all again. Um, have a great afternoon. We appreciate your time.